I, uh, my family and I, we do that every year. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. You know, it's amazing. I, I don't know if any of you noticed that. I have that same pair of underwear. <laughs> I don't know. What are they? I didn't send it to him, but... Uh... Well, like so many others, um, this family was tired of the rat race, and they decided to, to make their way off to greener pastures and uh, slower life, so they moved to Montana out of the big city and um, they bought a ranch. And when it came time to name their ranch, they were having a discussion about it as a family. The dad, being leader of the home, his name was Cletus, and he was kind of a crazy guy, and he liked that, so he wanted to name his ranch the Crazy Cletus Ranch. And the mom, of course, uh, had things to say about it and said, you know, uh, we've had such a rat race for so long, and I'm really looking forward to getting lazy out here on the ranch, so her name, of course, was Jane, and she wanted to name it the, the Lazy Jane Ranch. They had two boys, Jethro and Millard, and uh, Jethro was kind of a happy-go-lucky kind of guy, and keeping with uh, a little bit of the pattern, he wanted to name the ranch the Jolly Jethro Ranch. And Millard was, of course, the quiet, mellow type, and he wanted to throw in his two cents and say, I think we should name the ranch the Mellow Millard Ranch. They drew straws and they, you know, did all kinds of things and they couldn't come to an agreement. And finally they said, okay, the only way we can settle this is if we just go ahead and name our ranch the Crazy Cletus Lazy Jane Jolly Jethro Mellow Millard Ranch. <laughs> so they went ahead and did that and they named it that and um, uh, they had been there on the ranch for a certain amount of time and it came time for all their friends who were in the city to go out and visit them and they made their trek out there to visit their friends up on the crazy Cletus, Lazy Jane, Jolly Jethro, Mellow Millard Ranch. And uh, they got there and as they drove up to the front of it, sure enough, there was a big, huge wood cutout that said, Welcome to the Crazy Cletus, Lazy Jane, Jolly Jethro, Mellow Millard Ranch. And they drove down the dirt road and they noticed as they were looking on this huge ranch, they saw the ducks in the pond, they saw the horses galloping, the sheep were grazing, the chickens were clucking, and the pigs were oinking, and all the, the farm animals that they expected to see. And they get up to the door and they ring the doorbell and uh, Cletus answers and says, Welcome to the crazy Cletus, Lazy Jane, Jolly Jethro, Mellow Millard Ranch. And they said, well, before we go any further, we, we have to ask a question. We said, when we were driving up, we noticed the ducks, we noticed the horses, the sheep, the chickens, the pigs, but we noticed that you, you didn't have any cows. Why don't you have any cows? And they all kind of lowered their heads, and Cletus said, well, we had a lot of cows at one time, but none of them survived the branding. Okay, all right, all right. I want you to know, the first service, I barely got a laugh out of it, and I was going to change my joke. And then I had multiple people come to me begging me not to, so uh, you, they were going to be the only ones who heard it. We should probably uh, go to the Lord in prayer, huh? Good idea. All right, let's pray. Lord, this morning we thank you for who you are. And as you know, God, my heart is very heavy um, for the things that you've laid on it to share. And Lord, I don't want any of your children today in any way, shape, or form to feel condemned. I, I, I know that's your heart, Lord, because you said there, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. For the law of the spirit of life has set us free from the law of the spirit of sin and death. So I don't want that for anyone. And yet, God, I know that this subject and this issue is so, so near and dear to your heart. It was the first thing that you created as far as institutions are concerned. And so, God, I pray that all of us today would have ears to hear what you want to say, what you want to say to us. And I pray, Lord, that we would be open and respond where we are. We pray these things now in the most mighty, holy, and precious name of Jesus. Amen. Before I um, start, I, I, I want to say to you, as I even prayed, 
This is the first time that Pastor Ralph in 16 years of being here has actually given me charge of a subject. He said, I want you to teach on this. He's always given me the freedom to teach wherever I felt led. And he asked me this morning to teach on family and marriage. And I thought, well, I, I might know a little bit about that. That's probably about the only thing I know a lot about. So how do I condense, you know, 40, 50 hours into 40 minutes? Um, and you're about to find out. Uh, but uh, I know that all of you, including those in the cafe this morning, you're all at different places. Uh, we have single parents here who are so precious to God. And I know that if you're a single parent for some reason, somehow you've been through a lot. And uh, I don't want you to feel in any way, shape, or form condemned this morning. I know there's a lot of couples here who are struggling. I know that for a fact. And I know a lot of couples are doing great. And if you are, then I would challenge you, especially those of you who are doing great. You need to be a light and a beacon in a world that has taken the institution of the family and pretty much flushed it. And so please, get out there and make a difference. But again, receive this morning right where you are. I don't want to drudge up your past. I don't want to get into your history. I just want you this morning to hear fresh and new because this morning is the first day of the rest of your life. And I do believe that through the power of the Holy Spirit, some radical changes can be made in your lives. The family is a, is a beautiful place. The family is a place where we receive our identity. I know that for me, in my home, uh, oftentimes I tell my daughters, as a matter of fact, multiple times every week, I say, we are the reeds. And the reeds don't do things that way when all their friends are watching certain things or doing certain things. And I say, but you, you have to understand, Kayla and Shauna, we're the reeds. And the reeds are the best family in the whole world. <laughs> I've got them pretty much brainwashed to think so. <laughs> it's not good when they start telling other families that we're the reeds, we're the best family. But <clears throat> it's where we receive our identity. I know for me and my family, uh, I received my identity as who I am much from my parents. Probably more so from my dad uh, in a lot of ways. I find myself doing things exactly like he did them and acting the way he acted or talking the same way he talked or joking the same way he jokes. And I'm so fortunate that my wife loves my dad because, uh, <laughs> you know, every day, oh, I can, I can see your dad doing that. But then she smiles because it's usually a good thing. It would be a tragedy if my dad wasn't a great man, wouldn't it? So much of our identity we receive from our family. Our family is a sanctuary where we're accepted and restored after we have stumbled or erred. There's no family. There's no one to come home to. It's where the prodigal comes home and where we're restored when we've done wrong. The family is a laboratory where spiritual principles are tested under all conditions. It's where we learn to walk with God. It's where we learn to... To, to rub with each other, especially when we have siblings. <laughs> uh, one of the things I used to love about taking kids on outreaches, youth group, is for two weeks we'd be together and they would inevitably, within a matter of 10 minutes, be on each other's nerves. And they would start driving each other crazy, but they wouldn't have anywhere to run. They couldn't just run away. They had to work it through because we were still going to be there for two weeks. So they learned to work through their problems. And a family is that. You know, my daughters are learning how to socialize and learning how to walk through forgiveness and restoration and repentance and learning how to be best friends as sisters and protect each other and all those wonderful things. A family is a place of love and acceptance and moral and ethical training, correction and discipline. It's a place that we draw from in our lives whatever was placed in them in the storehouse of morality. My family is a place where I learn not to eat at the table unless you have a shirt on. Drove my mom crazy. You didn't get a bite until you put a shirt on. It's where you learn not to talk when your mouth is full. It's where you learn that when you're in a room and everyone's sitting down and somebody who's older walks in, you stand up and you offer them your seat. So many don't do that because it's not in their storehouse. It was never placed there. They can't go in their mind to that shelf and pull it off there and apply it in their life. And my storehouse is full because of my family. Of course, the family is, most importantly, a place of evangelism. We all know that 
the vast majority of people Ralph often speaks of come to know Jesus Christ before they're 18 years of age. And so we as parents are given that charge to raise our children to fear and to love God. I know that as my daughters are at church, they're being Kayla, my oldest, in sixth grade now, which is quite a, an amazingly difficult thing to handle that she's in junior high because I used to be a junior high pastor. And uh, she now is being taught by Pastor Abel. And I know that my other daughter, Kayla, is being taught by many different teachers and has been from the time they were children. But I also understand that they are not surrogate parents, that my responsibility as a parent to raise them is my own. It's not to be given to somebody else. But the family certainly is a beautiful place, and it's a precious place to God. You'll find several things about me as I share them with you. They're little nuggets, and I would ask that you would jot them down as they come because there are a few things that I'll say that will be important for changing how you live. For instance, I believe that uh, the Bible teaches that when a husband and a wife, when they become married, they are a family. You don't have to have children to make you a family. Children are a welcomed addition to your family. And now how does that affect your life? Well, it means that the priority relationship in your home is your marriage. And oftentimes when there's strain in a marriage, typically the woman will place more of her emotional energy into her children because she's not getting it or giving it to her husband. The priority of the home has to be the marriage. You'll find that, uh, uh, that obviously it's uh, God's uh, original institution that he created and it's very precious to him. It's a, it's a very beautiful picture to him of Christ and the church. And I think that's why Satan hates it so much. You'll find that in my opinion, uh, and I can't biblically support this, but I believe that if Satan is real, and he is, we know that, I can biblically support that, but if he hates certain things into degrees, uh, and I believe he does, the thing he often would probably hate the least would be like a, maybe a Satan worshiper, I don't know. Maybe next would be an atheist or an agnostic. He, he hates them still, but some people when they get up to the top and they say, who does Satan hate the most? Some people say pastors because they impart truth or they give the word or they, and he knows if he can trip them up, then he takes the, the flock with them and stuff like that. That may be true. We're up there. But I believe at the top of Satan's list of his attack and his bombardment is the Christian marriage. I believe he hates that more than anything on the planet because of all the things that we just shared and all the things that we will share. And so his attack is fierce. And we know that Satan loves to take something that is precious to God and he loves to defile, destroy, destroy, and disgrace it. As one commentator says, marriage is an institution of God. All of our thinking on the subject has its basis in the divine revelation, the holy scriptures. God himself was the originator when he said this, for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they two shall become one flesh. It is apparent that our maker instituted this as an experience of love to provide his own idea of a, get this, proper social order and to provide that through well-ordered families truth and holiness might be transmitted from one age to another. Basically a nation is only as strong as its families. We learn from the scriptures that Jesus honored a marriage festival with his presence and I think that it is not without significance that he chose this occasion to begin his miracles when he turned the water into wine. I think it is not out of order either that the Holy Spirit speaking through Paul selected the symbol of a husband and a wife as an apt emblem of the union that binds together Christ himself and his own blood bought ransom church. One more time that last sentence. Paul selected the symbol of a husband and a wife as an apt emblem of the union that binds together Christ himself and his own blood bought ransom church. The family is very precious to God. As Gary Bauer states, he says, Americans have endured their own form of captivity in recent years. We have been held hostage by a culture that mocks family values, no doubt. And again, I want to remind you, I'm going to speak things today that might churn up emotions to you, but take them and give them back to the Lord and say, God, because he is not going to condemn you. Every 21 seconds a divorce occurs in America. One million kids every year watch their parents split up. Families dissolve at a greater rate in the United States than any other major industrialized nation. In father absence from the home, the USA also places first. More than two million grandparents have their grandchildren living in their home because they have no parents to watch them. 
A marriage is more likely broken by divorce than it is by death in our day. And it is easier in our country to walk away from a marriage than from a commitment to purchase a used car. This holy, sacred, beautiful institution that God created. You need to know this, I'm sure you do. But oftentimes we don't talk about it. But God's word is very clear and emphatic. In God's word in Malachi 2.16 it says, For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce. For it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. God himself says, I hate divorce. The institution that he created in the beginning, the place where he wanted the gospel to be propagated to the children, how he wanted to have marriage relationships produce holiness between the two people. Do you know that God meant for marriage to make you holy more than happy? Because there is no more sanctifying relationship on this planet than between you and the one that God has given you. That's why you drive each other crazy. That's why you bother each other. That's why it's harder to live with that person than anybody else on the planet. That's why you get along so well with all your other friends, but you have such a difficult time because it's sanctifying and it's shaping and it's molding. So why does God hate divorce? I think it's clear because it destroys that which God loves, you. It destroys that which is precious to God, you. And God hates it because he hates to see his people whom he loves so much in pain. And that's all it does produce. Let's take a look at 10 precious to God, and they are people who choose divorce. After two years, seven out of 10 will seriously consider their divorce a mistake. Five out of 10 will have already gone through another divorce. The majority of the people will still be angry and bitter against their spouse, which will have an impact on their relationships with their children. Get this, only one of those 10 people will even say that their life is happy and satisfying after they were divorced. What does it do to the children? The poverty rate for children living in single parent homes is 10 times the rate of children living in two parent homes. Children who grow up in fractured homes are less likely to graduate from high school than children from intact families. A disproportionate number of runaway teens come from step-parent households. Young sons often experience nightmares and a father hunger, as they say, soon after the dad leaves home. In their teens, they are more likely to have increased levels of aggression, gang membership, and other emotional and behavioral problems. Young daughters of divorce often experience anxiety and guilt and their teens are more likely to be sexually involved, marry younger, be pregnant more often before marriage, and become divorced or separated from their eventual husbands. Children of divorce typically experience depression, drug and alcohol experimentation, and a diminished ability to form lasting relationships. Why does God hate it? Because it destroys that which he loves. Families have been bludgeoned for more than two decades, and now society is paying the penalty. I have friends who are flight attendants, and they tell me of the children that are going across the country to visit the other spouse. And they tell me, they say, Pastor Mike, these kids, they wet their pants on the plane. They're catatonic, and they're scared. And I say, Lord, truly this is why you hate it. This is why he hates it, because it destroys all that is precious to God. Most people that I meet in my ministry believe that they only have two options when their marriage is not all that it should be. And I understand and know that really only Adam and Eve probably had the perfect marriage. You know, he didn't have to hear about all the people she could have married. <laughs> right? And she didn't have to hear about how wonderfully his mother cooked, right? <laughs> but most people who are in bad marriages say they, they think they only have two options. Number one, they stay in their marriage and be miserable. Or number two, they get a divorce. And I want you to know that God hates both those options. He doesn't like them. 
Okay, so if you're resigned to stay miserable, he doesn't like that. And if you say, well, I'm going to get a divorce, he doesn't like that either. There is another option, and I know it works because I've seen it work in countless couples. And you may say to me, Pastor Mike, you don't understand. You don't know what I'm married to. Well, let me tell you, I think that God probably put in the Bible Paul, who was Saul, who murdered Christians so none of us could say God can't forgive us. Because I don't know how many of you have murdered people and then God can't forgive you of that. Well, God can forgive you of anything, just like in a marriage. You may say, well, you don't know how bad it is. Well, if it's worse than a couple that walked into my office, 10 years of marriage, multiple affairs, both partners, drugs their whole marriage, they didn't love each other, they didn't even like each other. And they said to me, but we don't want to get divorced. And I watched them fight like crazy for their marriage, and they won. It can be done, yes it can, but it takes an immense amount of effort to fight like crazy. And one of the first things that you need to do is that you need to get out of your mind that divorce is an option. <clears throat> because when you have that as an option, you'll never go forward with the same tenacity you would if it wasn't. If you have a, a marriage of misery in front of you and you feel like things are bad, and you know that there's landmines land and there's, there's bullets flying and strafing everywhere, but you have this little back door of divorce, which close to 62% of Orange County now chooses, leading in the nation amongst Christians. If you have that divorce door, you'll never go forward with the same reckless abandonment and fighting like crazy because your life depends on it as you would if you can just slip out that door. If you cement that door away and you don't let it be there, then you will go forward. In my marriage right now, I can tell you that divorce is not an option. Did you know that the number one cry of youth today is a family that love each other? Do you know the number one fear of youth today is that mom and dad will break up? You see, kids know when things aren't right with mom and dad because their whole world is mom and dad. Can you remember hearing your mom and dad fight and having that inside of you, your whole world shatter and shake? They know. And it hurts them deeply. And I know single parents have such a difficult time. And again, I, I, I don't want to condemn and I don't want to beat you up. I just want you today, from this day forward, to know that it's worth fighting for. It's worth going to the mat for. I shared with uh, the first service this morning and a dear sister came up to me and she said, at my husband's funeral, my son stood up and said, the most important thing I can say about my dad is that he loved my mom. And I had another brother come to me and say, when I was growing up, and this man's probably in his 50s or 60s, and he said, I remember distinctly when I grew up, when I would hear my mom and dad fight, for three months I would have a stutter. I couldn't talk for three months because my whole world was shaken. A study done by Merton P. Stroman discovered five basic cries of youth. As stated by one of these cries, this cry is an expression of a need of a young person to be a part of a family whose members love and accept and care about one another. The number one priority in your home is your marriage. The most important thing a father can do for his children is to love their mother. And the most important thing a mother can do for her children is to love their father. One of my favorite books is written by a man named Zig Ziglar who wrote a book called Courtship After Dating. And he says, when my son was about 15 years old, we were taking a walk and holding a serious father-to-son conversation. I asked him, son, if anyone should ask you what you like best about your dad, what would you say? He paused for a moment, and he said, I'd say that the thing I like best about my dad is that he loves my mom. Naturally, he asked, son, why would you say that? He responded, I know because you love mom, you're going to treat her right. And as long as you treat her right, we will always be a family because I know how much mom loves you. 15 years old. Then he said some words that verbalized the feelings of children all over America. That means, Dad, that I will never have to choose between you or mom. He goes on to say that his son had just his best friend that very day from his parents said, uh, uh, who would you rather live with, mom or dad? And this friend of his was telling him how traumatic that was. Here's the deal. 16 years of pastoring, which doesn't make me an expert, I know that. 
in a lot, a lot of counseling and meeting a lot, a lot of couples and having a marriage myself, I have discovered one very, very, very important thing. And it was a revelation to me, believe it or not, an obvious one, really. And that is that every one of you in this room are selfish pigs. <laughs> you know how I know that? Because I'm a selfish pig of the first degree. If you could live a selfless life, you would have no marriage problems. But we're very selfish people. And the problem is that we always have the eye upon the other person to change, to make our marriage good. I know when a couple comes into my office, or usually it's not a couple, it's the one that's, you know, and they say, hey, pastor, if you only knew what I was married to, let me tell you, whoa, and they start unleashing. And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, first of all, this is going to be a tough one. Because all psychologists know, and I'm not a psychologist, they know that the most difficult people in the world to minister to or help are those who blame the world for everything that's happened to them. Or those who look to the other person and say, this is the reason my marriage stinks is because of him or because of her. We must get our eyes off of the other person to meet our needs and say, Lord Jesus, look here. Because until you're 100% of everything that God wants you to be as a man, as a husband, as a father, as a wife, as a mother, as a woman, you cannot blame the other person. And guess what? None of us will ever be there. And the neat thing is when you get your eyes off of your mate, you will have much more peace and you'll have a much more satisfying marriage as well. Keep the finger pointed at yourself. The beginning of our couple retreats, I begin with an exhortation to the couples and I would say it to you too. Broken marriages begin to mend and communication is reestablished when one of the partners is willing to make a breakthrough and say, Lord, begin with me. I am the one who needs to change to love more deeply and more wisely. Even if you think your spouse is 100% wrong, when you stand in the presence of Christ, you will begin to see that you too have shortcomings. You will discern where you have failed to accept responsibility for the marital relationship and you will be able to say, God, change me. The Christian is committed to follow Christ who went all the way in love all the time. So for a start, stop demanding that your partner change his or her ways and let God start changing you. And when you can do that, your whole outlook on your marriage will change. I've been a pastor the whole time that my wife and I have been married, 16 years. Seven years into our marriage, I remember sitting in my office and I got a letter from Hannah. I was thinking it would probably be one of those juicy love letters. It wasn't a juicy love letter. It was a letter basically crying out and saying, our marriage is miserable. Like a typical guy, I thought everything was okay. <laughs> and I remember reading the letter and thinking to myself, these are hard words. Lord, I know that I can either respond or I can resent this letter. I said, God, help me respond. Help me respond. Out of that moment, the whole family and marriage ministry was born because I began to study and I began to become a student of the gift that God had given me. Because right now, if I was to poll this audience of married people, the average woman would rate their marriage three points lower than the average man on a scale of one to 10. So I knew that I needed to awaken and not allow complacency to run my marriage. We need to be a student of the gift that God has given us. Do you understand that? And it is an exciting journey when you do it, trust me. Because seven years of just mediocre turned into vibrant excitement. No, we don't have a perfect marriage, and yes, we do have difficulty. But it has been a lot of fun learning about Hannah. And learning that, I can celebrate her differences. I used to try to make her like me. God forbid, who would want to marry me? Why would anybody want to marry me that I'm trying to make her like me? 
So I want to be married to me? No. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. And I'm a logical person, see? And that's where we get in trouble because A is B, B is C, A is C. You can't feel that way, Hannah. Now it makes sense. I've learned to appreciate the fact that whether or not it's logical, she has a right to feel it. It's a celebration for me. And you know what? How many of you men know what your wives' love languages are? Well, you should. How many of you wives know what the top five needs of your husband are? Well, you should. Because you should be a student of your mate. Sure, we know that the average woman speaks 25,000 words a day and the average man speaks 10,000. But who cares about that? <laughs> right? You don't need to know the average generality. Men are logical, women are emotional. You need to know what your mate is, because they're not going to fit the generalities. Maybe you're a man who speaks 50,000, your wife speaks two. <laughs> I'd like to talk to you and uh, find out how you do it. But uh, nonetheless, you need to be a student of the mate that God has given you. You don't need to know my wife. I don't need to know yours. You don't need to know me. You need to know the mate that God has given you. I can tell you in the last nine years, I have learned a trem tremendous amount about my wife. And it's been a celebration like you can't believe. It's been one wonderful, wonderful fun. We need to respect one another, but also respect one another's differences. You know that men have heavier blood than women? Did you know that? Do you know that they have 20% more red corpuscles? That means more oxygen to the body, which means generally more energy. We need to have grace for each other, don't we? Do you know that men have thicker skin? And a lot thicker skulls, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's why men don't tend to wrinkle so quickly. There's a reason why men age more gracefully. How much more grace do we need to have? Women have an extra layer of fat underneath their skin, which gives them smoother skin, cooler in the summer, and makes them warmer in the winter. Do you know that men have larger bones than women and are arranged differently? Obviously. Women's pelvic bones are wider than a man, which forces her to put more energy into every step, which is why she tires more easily. It's why you're 100 yards ahead of her at Disneyland and saying, come on, <laughs> come on. A little more grace. Put some high heels on that baby, those big hips. You try it sometime. <laughs> men have a higher ratio of muscle to fat, 40% for men and 20% for women. What does that mean? That it's easier for a man to lose weight. A little more grace, huh? A little more grace. To learn to celebrate those differences. What a glorious thing. You need to give us grace, too, ladies. You're always wondering what we're thinking? Well, Dave Barry says, think how much happier women would be if instead of endlessly fretting about what their males and their lives are thinking, they could relax, secure in the knowledge that the correct answer is very little. <laughs> very little. You know, men need to be told things twice. You know that. Maybe three times at least. Men lose things and women find them. <laughs> Hannah, where's the peanut butter? I've looked for 10 minutes. Right there, ding dong. <laughs> you know that scripture says that when God made Eve, he put man into a deep sleep. And you know that scripture never says he came out of it? <laughs> You know that? <laughs> it all spells more grace for one another. Your differences can make you aggravate and go or celebrate and grow. Men, we need to learn to bear with our wives and not be a bear with our wives. I know a husband or heard of a husband who was advised by a psychiatrist to assert himself Psychiatrist said, you don't have to let your wife henpeck you or boss you around. Go home and show her you're the boss. The husband takes the doctor's advice. He rushes home, slams the door, shakes his fist in his wife's face and growls. From now on, you're going to take orders from me. I want my supper right now. And when you get to on the table, go upstairs and lay out my best clothes. Tonight, I'm going out with the boys and you're going to stay home where you belong. 
And another thing, guess who's going to comb my hair, give me a shave, and tie my necktie? His wife says calmly, the undertaker. <laughs> <laughs> Truly, we need to learn our differences and why they're there. God gave us a gift, men, that's so radically different than us to complete us. We need to learn about our cycles. That was one of the greatest revolutionary things for me, coming from a family with three boys, a dad and a male dog. <laughs> And my mom never really told me much about those things. I guess that was one of those things she left to the, you know, your own. I never could figure out the whole cycle thing. I figured, you know, if you know it's coming, you can plan for it, logical, you know. You can talk yourself out of being that way. Not gonna happen. So you learn during those cycles, right? You learn things to say and not to say, like a dangerous thing to say is, what's for dinner? A safer thing to say is, can I help you with dinner? <laughs> and the safest thing to say is, where would you like to go for dinner? <laughs> it's all about learning. It's all about growing. A dangerous thing to say, are you wearing that? <laughs> A safer thing is, gee, you, you look good in brown. <laughs> safest is, wow, look at you. <laughs> right? Dangerous. What are you so worked up about? Safer? Could we be overreacting? <laughs> Safest is here's 50 bucks. <laughs> here's a dangerous one, men. Should you be eating that? <laughs> Safer, do you know that there's some apples left? <laughs> Safest, of course, can I get you a glass of wine with that? <laughs> dangerous. What did you do all day? <laughs> wow. Guys, are you learning? <laughs> Safer, I hope you didn't overdo it today. <laughs> Safest, I've always loved you in that robe. A good marriage is a union of two forgivers. Do you know that your mate is not your enemy? And Satan wants you to believe that he is or she is. As a matter of fact, why don't you right now, if you're married and you're here together, why don't you turn to your mate and say, you are not my enemy. If you can't do that, then maybe you think they are. And if you can't say it with true meaning, maybe you believe they are. I meet all kinds of people, people who don't have the tools, you give them the tools and they have a great marriage. I mean, people who have all the tools and they don't live them. They're like James, they're just hearers of the word and not doers of the word. I've met couples that have been through every pastor in the church in counseling. They've been in counseling for 15 years. They could teach on seminars on how to be married and they have a miserable marriage. That's not right, is it? Because simply but truly, if you do the things that God has called you to do, you cannot fail but we don't do them. Let me give you some great tools here. Spoil each other. Never yell at each other unless the house is on fire. <laughs> See, I come from a family where my mom and dad didn't yell at each other. So I don't yell at my wife. Yes, I lose it. Yeah, I lose, I, you know, sometimes I get mad and angry, but I don't yell. Volunteer, say, I'll help, can I help with that? You know, my body is racked with physical suffering most of the time. But when I'm able to get enough gump up, I did six loads of laundry yesterday. And you know what? I felt great about it, even though I didn't feel great. <laughs> because I want to help my wife. I want to set her free from some of the things that she does all the time. How about simple thank yous? When's the last time you said, thank you for doing the laundry? When's the last time you just said, thank you for cooking the meals? Either way, goes both ways. How about thank yous all the time? How about learning to say, I'm sorry? You know, you'll win more fights by being sorry than you will by being right. How do you introduce your mate? This is my, you know, or 
This is the most gorgeous woman in the universe, and you know what? I believe it about my wife. I do, and I introduce her that way. And the neat thing is, for me in my life, my very best friends are men who love their wives. Those are the people I hang out with. I don't hang out with men who talk ill of their wives at all. I won't put up with it. Even in my accountability group, we had a covenant that none of us would ever say anything ill about our wives because we knew the answer was here. How do you talk about your husbands, ladies? Should be nothing but good things, even if there isn't much good to say. How about you wives saying to your husbands when they come home, I'm so glad you're home. What a great thing to come home to. Laugh together, give gifts. It's always the right gift when you give it from your heart. Make sure that you date each other. Go out with each other. If you have children, that's probably dead. It was passion that gave you your kids and it's kids that took away your passion. <laughs> Go out and date each other. <laughs> Neglect the whole world rather than each other. And then a big one for me, which I did for seven years of my marriage, don't go to bed angry. I know this isn't easy. Maybe like me, you have seven years of habits of doing things wrong, but you need to stop the habits. You need to change them and become biblical. We made a covenant, we're not gonna go to bed angry. And yeah, that meant several months of three o'clock in the morning, letting the other person know that you're still awake in case they wanna say they're sorry. <laughs> You shake the left leg so they know you're still awake, you know, or... <sighs> no more for us, because there's peace. You need to fight for peace in your home. And yeah, it's hard work. You need to never let the words come out of your mouth. Fine, maybe you married the wrong person. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. <laughs> you know, throwing the clothes out the window like one couple I counseled. She did it every week. I'm, I'm like... You know what? That was an amazing couple, too. I gave them a packet, and it was don't go to bed angry, and don't say these things anymore, and it had a whole bunch of other things. And I called them back to set up another appointment. I said, hey, pastor, we don't need it. We're doing great. 20 years of marriage of going to bed angry and saying, you married the wrong person. Don't do it. They stopped those two things, and it changed their marriage. It's amazing what tools will do. And remember, divorce is not an option. Never will be. At our couples retreats, we give the couples a box, a pretty box. And I have it in my office on my desk and I have it at home. I've done many couples retreats so I get a box every time. And inside the box is a little paragraph. It's just a card that says this. Most people get married believing a myth they believe that marriage is a beautiful box full of all the things they have longed for. They believe the box is full of companionship, sexual fulfillment, intimacy, and friendship. The truth is, marriage at the start is an empty box. You must put something in it before you can take something out. There's no love in marriage. Love is in people, and people put it into marriage. There is no romance in marriage. People have to infuse it into their marriages. A couple must learn this art, the habit of giving, the habit of loving, of serving, and of praising. It is up to you as a couple to keep your box full. Or I should say it is up to you as an individual to keep your box full. If you take out more than you put in, the box will be empty. Oh, precious people. Our families are so precious to God. Our marriages are so precious to God. And if you have a good one, fight to keep it good. And be a light in a dark world full of marriages that are falling apart all around us. Get your eyes off of what your mate needs to do and say, Lord, begin with me and start changing me, God. And I promise you, if you set into action the tools that God has placed in his word, you can have as much fun at being married as I'm having. And it is a blast. And I didn't know how good it could be even after seven years of living in complacency and compromise in my marriage. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you this morning 
for your grace and your mercy. And Lord, I pray that couples would offer more and more grace to each other. And for those who are in here, God, I know who are hurting and maybe have just gone through a divorce or in the middle of it or... I just pray, Jesus, that you would be there for them. Touch them, God, fill them. For those wives who are discouraged and feel like there's no way, fill them with strength through the power of your Holy Spirit, God. For husbands, awaken us from our slumber to become the men that you want us to be, God, in our homes, the fathers, the husbands. Challenge and change us, Lord, we pray. We give you this day and we ask you to do these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. On your way out today, I wrote husbands a letter, I wrote wives a letter, and I wrote singles a letter. If you're in high school or a single, I wrote a letter to you. Make sure you get one. Husbands, don't let your wives read yours, and wives, don't let your husbands read yours. They're just to you. And find a time today, maybe, where you can be quiet and alone and read it and say, Lord, help me respond so that I can be better than what I am now. In Jesus' name. Ushers, come forward this morning as we receive this morning's tithes and offerings.